bring it out that way. Um, in fact, um, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison initially didn't think the Ninth and Tenth Amendments were necessary because they were so obviously true they didn't need to be included. State constitutions are different. State constitutions, state constitutional law assumes that the government already has all the power and that you don't even need to enumerate. It has what's called the police power. And so actually in that kind of system, the Ninth Amendment, their Tenth Amendment style of addition is actually much more important for state law than it is for federal law. So I, I think it's a really, I've not heard of that actually, it's a very good idea um, because with a state constitution, you have to actually enumerate the things you don't want the government to have. Otherwise, it's assumed the state has general jurisdiction to pass all sorts of laws for morals, health, safety, uh, what have you. And why the other side has to take so long? Uh, well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, there's not much about the Constitution involved, but I, can, I think I can explain, which is that uh, there's a federal law which says for purposes of calculating the budget deficit, you have to calculate how much things cost over a 10-year period. So you'll notice a lot of laws that get passed try to evade this by putting off the cost until after the 10-year period and then having them realized. That doesn't seem to count for federal accounting purposes. So that's why, that's just an explanation why it's this funny 10-year thing. Uh, I will say this, I think that um, what the first two years of the Obama administration did is it, it, it changed the baseline of what was considered regular government spending to uh, way above normal historical levels. I mean, the historical levels, right, roughly the federal government has, uh, the budgets usually, since World War II, has been something around 18 to 20 percent of GDP. And I think, uh, I'm not an economist, but I think it's more around 24 percent or 23 percent under a a lot of money. Um, and so it's always harder once the federal government has that money, and that's considered the baseline, to cut away from it. Um, it's just you know, something we've seen over the last, uh, you know, since 1945. Um, that doesn't mean you can't do it. I mean, so Paul Ryan in today's introduced, I think, a very ambitious plan to try to bring the government back into balance by, you know, within 10 years. I have to say, it seems to me that uh, the real problem is entitlement programs, because Usually the way the federal government worked originally was uh, you know, Congress would create a program and fund a specific amount of money to fund it. Title and programs are different. They don't depend on a specific sum of money. They hand out federal dollars based on whether people qualify for benefits so that it doesn't have any kind of set pile of money that's devoted every year by Congress beforehand. The size of the program is determined just by the class of people who qualify. Um, so I think I personally think this doesn't have to do with constitutional. I personally think until that is uh, reformed, it's not going to be possible actually to balance the budget and end these kinds of deficits. Thank you. Thanks. Richard says I should keep this short, so I'm just going to say yes or no for that. <laughs> Can I have $100? <laughs> do you work for GM or Chris? <laughs> That's great. Article 5. Uh, there seems to be, oh, my name's Harold Purvey. Uh, there seems to be a growing movement, uh, sub movement in the country, especially among conservatives, to uh, institute an Article 5 constitutional convention, uh, making essentially an end run around Congress. Uh, I was wondering what you thought about Article 5. Are there rules for how the delegates are picked, how could, such a convention could actually operate, um, and how much power such a convention could have? That's a great question. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Constitution actually sets out two ways to amend the Constitution. One is a constitutional amendment, which has to pass two-thirds of Congress and then three-quarters of the state legislatures. And that doesn't happen very often. Or, as he said, you could call a constitutional convention, um, which is always, uh, as you can imagine, has really frightened Congress. Because once the convention starts, there's no way Congress is allowed to interfere with it, and there's no way really to limit it, what it does. Right? The, con the convention that set up our Constitution today uh, wasn't authorized to do what it did. They threw out the Articles of Confederation on their own and set up this new Constitution. The Articles of Confederation actually told them to do something far more narrow, to propose some amendments. Instead, they came back with this whole new Constitution. So there's always been this uh, fear in the political establishment of having a constitutional convention because it's unknown what would happen. I would say, I think, personally, I think this could be a solution to California's problems. I don't think it would be such a bad thing to have a 
Constitution, Constitutional Convention for the California Constitution. Because I think that's the only way you're really going to have some fundamental political reform these days. Um, and I know there have been some movements actually to call one for the state um, to try to get around the way interest groups have really bottled up uh, the legislative process. So the federal one, uh, there haven't been enough votes to call a Constitutional Convention as far as I know. Uh, but uh, I I think the political side should have to fight tooth and nail to stop it from happening. And so I would expect the odds of it are not uh, that great. Yes, Professor, my name is Rex Up, and uh, I apologize for not for making that squeak. <laughs> for, not, for not knowing more about you. In fact, until you were scheduled for this meeting, I probably didn't know anything about you. But the Conservative Forum has this meeting every month and have great conservative speakers every month. And can you tell us what it is about you that invited those special guests here? <laughs> There's something different going on here. If you can't figure that out by now, <laughs> maybe you need to hear some more of them outside. You know, obviously, they're very unhappy about the Bush administration's terrorism policies. And uh, you know, they, they think I'm a war criminal. They think Rumsfeld's a war criminal. Ashcroft, Cheney, Bush, and everybody who was basically involved in terrorism policy in the Bush administration. Um, I think there's a principled view, obviously, uh, if you're a very strong civil libertarian, to oppose what the Bush administration did. Uh, I tend to think that the Bush administration struck a good balance between protecting the country from another attack, which I would add is something in certain history did not happen. Uh, if you go back to 9-11, everybody thought there was going to be a second a successful attack. It was too hard to stop. And I I think the measures we took um, might have been aggressive, but I think they succeeded in preventing another attack. And you can tell they're trying to... As you can see from the deal, of course, that Al-Qaeda is trying, like the Dickens, to succeed again. Um, the reason I don't take these particular individuals seriously is because uh, you know, the way you cure this, if you disagree with the policies, you'll go to the ballot box and elect different people. Well, they elected different people. And, you know, initially they tried to change the policies, and then they just reversed themselves. So maybe they're a little more frustrated with, uh, you know, President Obama than they are with me at this point. Or they should be. On the other hand, I'm glad Obama has changed his policies, because I think now that he's not a candidate, now that he's in office, he's read the intelligence reports, and he sees actually the intelligence that we were seeing in the Bush administration, he realizes that the security of the country is under far more threat than he thought when he was just a first-term senator with two years in office. <laughs> yeah. Professor, my name is Guy Berry. I, I, I don't totally understand executive orders and why, once they're done, Congress can't come back and change them or stop them or whatever. Could you explain that? Well, there's two kinds of executive orders, and one kind, uh, Congress can't overrule. Congress can't overrule executive orders on probably most things that the president issues executive orders on. Usually, they're interpretations of statutes that Congress has passed, and Congress can definitely. Oftentimes, Congress wants the president to issue executive orders instead uh, because they can't reach a consensus on their own, and so they leave it open for presidents to do. Um, the second kind they can't overrule, which have to do with the president um, making decisions you know, that have involved the president of the executive branch or that involve the presidency of the exercise of the president's own unique constitutional powers. So those the Congress you know, can't overrule. They can try to pressure the president into changing them. But, but let me give you an example. So um, you might read the EPA is studying whether to limit greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. That's a uh, regulation, but it's one that Congress can always overrule if it wants to, because the executive branch is just interpreting a law that Congress has already passed. Oftentimes, Congress doesn't want to take the responsibility to make these kinds of choices, like what the minimum gas mileage requirement should be for cars, or right, all these other areas of regulation. They would rather these agencies do it and take the responsibility. Hi, my name is Nene, and I wondered if you could comment on um, both Obama and, and actually George Bush going to the UN almost for permission, and this new doctrine, this responsibility to protect doctrine, where we get into the issue of is it in national security interests or not, it seems like we're going down a rabbit hole. 
Uh, uh, it's a good question. I, first of all, I, I think um, that the uh, agreement of the UN is nice to have, but I don't think that should make any difference for our own domestic constitutional debate over whether we're going to taking us into this war and that war, are all serving in this administration when we've gone to war against Libya with no approval from Congress. And so actually when Hillary Clinton was asked about this in a hearing, she said, oh, well, we don't need that because we have the permission of the UN. I actually think that's quite unconstitutional. Yeah. You know, it was a self-contained system, you know, it's the American system for making decisions. And I don't think our government can give that power away to some international body of any kind. Right? So, whether, whether it be you know, the UN on invasions or the World Trade Organization about trade, you know, these are you know, our own decisions to make. We have a Congress and we elect the president. That's how we make them. We don't, now, right, Europe's very different. And that's where I think a lot of the people who are in favor of this really want us to become more like Europe. In Europe, they do delegate a lot of their sovereignty to these unaccountable international organizations. Now, you know, if I was French or German or Italian in 1945, I might have liked that too. But it's not the American system, and I think I think it's unconstitutional. I think it might be nice politics to help it get allies and stuff, but it should never limit uh, our ability to defend our sovereignty and our own decisions.